I can point you to the two speakers that you have. Somehow, I'm not quite sure why I actually lost a little weight. Yeah, that's unusual. Yeah, no, that was that's the only good part. Wow, how did you do that? I just tripped. Well, uh, as you get older, the more you work out, the better you deal with tripping and yeah, other yeah, things. Yeah, I'm just, well. on yeah okay it works all right hi everybody my name is Daniel Bodea and my name is Matthew Miller and we are the co-presidents of the Harvard undergraduate economics association we're extremely excited to be hosting this exclusive fireside chat with Blackstone CEO and founder Stephen Schwarzman moderated by Harvard president emeritus and former secretary of the Treasury Larry Summers 
So at this point, we're going to hand it off to Safra, Professor of Economics at Harvard University, Jeremy Stein, to further introduce our event. Uh, and thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks for organizing. Welcome, everybody. And just want to thank, again, Steve and Larry for, uh, for doing this. I won't take any more time on, on, on introductions. These are the, you know, if anybody needs no, no introduction, it's these two. I just wanted to make one, one little observation. Um, Steve, I, I just started reading your book. I got it this morning. So I was trying to be diligent. I read just the first chapter, which I really, really liked. And I liked it because I think my favorite part in all of these things is trying to understand what people were like in high school. And, and because, you know, I think when the world looks at you and looks at Larry, you know, they see CEO or Treasury Secretary. And yet I think when we all look back out at the world, we look at the world through the eyes of the 13 or 16-year-old us. And, you know, the, the experiences we had at that age, where we came from, the slights we endured, how we started to have kind of a philosophy of stuff really kind of carries through. And I, that's what I thought was sort of interesting. And so if any of that manages to reflect in, in any of your comments, I think that would be uh, extremely interesting. But, but with that, please, uh, uh, again, thanks very much and welcome. Steve and I, let me thank the Undergraduate Economic Association for hosting uh, this event. And on behalf of Harvard, uh, let me thank uh, Steve uh, for coming here uh, to talk about uh, his life, uh, the world, and uh, his book. Uh, Steve and I have known each other for uh, many, many uh, years. I wasn't able to quite remember when uh, we first met, but I suspect it was uh, sometime in the 1990s when we both had much less gray hair uh, than we do now. And well, I was, we both had more hair. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, serving in uh, Washington, and Steve was uh, building uh, Blackstone. I confess I did uh, visit Steve a number of times uh, during my time as Harvard president, and you will record, you will note if you have read the entirety of his book that there are chapters devoted to his major philanthropic interactions with a number of institutions, of which Harvard is not one. Um, <laughs> one theory would be that that's a reflection of my incompetence and that of my successors. Um, another theory would be that that had something to do with the decision making of the admissions office at Harvard at a time when Steve was uh, in high school. I am going to choose to accept the latter hypothesis, um, though I'm going to remain very mindful of the possibility that the correct way to view things is that my numerous visits to Steve's office in uh, the early part of the decade of the noughts constituted the laying of a foundation for an event that would come to fruition many years hence yes. and that has not yet come uh, <laughs> to fruition. <laughs> and, uh, I know that President Bacow and Dean Gay uh, join me in the hope uh, that uh, that uh, proves uh, to be successful. Well, in, po it, in point of fact, uh, probably around five years ago, I, I, I told uh, the guys over at the business school I'd, I'd give them a big building, and um, you know they, they forgot to follow up. So, so, I, so, so, so I, I, I figured I'm done. Uh, you know, just, I well, I can assure you uh, that we at the Kennedy School um, will be delighted to follow up with passion, energy, humor, involvement, and virtually anything uh, that uh, you uh, that you want to see. Uh, somewhat more seriously. Uh, Steve has had a remarkable career, a graduate of Yale College, a graduate of uh, the Harvard uh, Business School, a stellar career as a 
prodigy investment banker at uh, Lehman, uh, the co-founder and longtime chief executive officer of uh, the Blackstone uh, Group, subsequently a whole range of statesmanlike roles ranging from chairman of uh, the Kennedy Center in uh, Washington to uh, the leader of the economic advisory group that uh, President Trump uh, formed when he took office in January of uh, 2017. We are, in all seriousness, uh, very, very fortunate uh, to have him here uh, at Harvard. Steve, maybe a place to start, and this would address a whole range of themes that you get into in your book, would be you're talking to a group uh, mostly of uh, students. A lot of what you describe in your book is a set of quite remarkable traits, extraordinary energy, perfectionism, integrity, determination to get things done that have carried you forward throughout uh, your career. But I want to go to a slightly different place. What are the two or three most important things that you feel like you know and understand now that you didn't know and understand when you left school? Well, that, that's a really good question. First of all, I'd like to just thank everybody for being here, and Larry especially. Uh, you know, we, we've done an occasional Punch and Judy show, uh, you know, sort of around the world. And Larry uh, teaches uh, at uh, Schwarzman College uh, at Chenhua University. And, you know, whenever he's there, it's like a, it's like a big hit. Uh, and so we really appreciate uh, him doing that, as well as, you know, the, the, the many years of uh, public service. Uh, that's not the easiest place to be. Uh, you know, as I've gotten older and, and seen it, it's a, it's, it's a bit more, you know, like playing hockey uh, than just giving advice. Uh, it's a contact sport. And uh, Larry's been serving the country for a very long time in a very distinguished way. So, you know, congratulations to you. So I guess the question is, what do I know now that I didn't? Uh, well, first, I, I, I know that uh, you're not at your maximum intelligence at 32. Uh, which is what we all think. Uh, you know, uh, when, you, when you're an undergraduate at Harvard, you think you're smart. You only get smarter. You peak at 32, and then you realize when you're 42, 52, 62, and 72, you, you actually weren't so smart uh, at 32. So, so be alert to that. Uh, secondly, um, you, you realize that, uh, that, that managing something uh, is, is, is a learned skill. Uh, and, and the more you do it, uh, the better you get. Uh, you think it should be easy. You see a problem, uh, and you know what the right answer is. Uh, the right answer isn't so hard. Uh, getting there with human beings is a lot more complicated. Uh, and, and you learn that by getting advice from people. You learn it by doing so the older you get the better your skills are uh, in, in, in that area. Um, I, I think uh, what you learn when you're older is what you're really good at and, and, and what you really need help in. Uh, n nobody is, um, you know, um, except maybe Michael Jordan or something, can do everything. Uh, and, you know, look at him trying to play baseball. That was hopeless, <laughs> right? Uh, one of the world's greatest basketball players, if not the best ever. Uh, and, and so what happens as you get older, you're much more in touch with the fact that, you know, even if you have great strengths uh, in one area, uh, almost no one has great strengths everywhere. And, and that you become aware uh, that, that, you know, a, a, a team is really necessary. A team is a funny uh, word brings up other things, but it's really you need other people who can compensate for what you, you don't do so well. Uh, and even if you're brilliant at two thirds of what you're supposed to be in charge of, there's the other third uh, that you're not. 
and, and so having the right people there is, is, is important. I guess a fourth thing um, is, is learning how to pick people. And when you're younger, uh, I find, or I found, uh, I, I wasn't as good at that um, as, as, as I've gotten. Um, now it's pretty easy to know a winner from a, a mega winner from what am I doing here, talking to this person. Uh, and, and, and that's a learned skill. Uh, you, you think you have it at every stage in your life, um, but you actually don't, uh, and, and that can be improved. Uh, so um, the final thing is um, you, you learn there are different types of intelligence. Uh, you know, um, one of the people who was uh, at my uh, college at Yale, the secretary of Yale, Sam Chauncey, his father, uh, worked with, I guess, one of the professors at... Uh, at Harvard and did the educational testing service in uh, World War uh, uh, II, uh, which is the SATs. And these, you know, these guys made a tragic mistake. They did it for free. Uh, they did it as a not-for-profit. And you know, at that time, I realized they were basically designing a test to test for college professors, uh, because that's what they were. That was the definition of intelligence. And you know, my mind doesn't work exactly like that. It's you know, different twists. And, and you realize that with all the people you deal with, um, they, 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 they have different talents. And it's not just a linear test uh, that makes a difference uh, at the end of the day. There are different ways of encountering the world, um, uh, taking on board uh, uh, facts that some people can see, some people don't even know they exist, and, and that that helps uh, determine uh, outcomes. So uh, I must say that Getting older and being experienced and, and still believing you're 16. I've given up on 16. 16 wasn't so great, actually. Uh, I, I sort of settled in at 38. 38 is a really good age to not get older. Uh, and if you, if you can keep your energy uh, just because you have a gift, you know, like s some parents got together and, you know, you have the energy gene. Um, you, you can't create it, but if you have it, uh, you, you can be as vital, active, creative, uh, having fun and taking on board learning that you never can imagine you can you you could you could onboard so successfully as you get older that you know you all are really lucky because this whole advancement in in biology and and pharmacology and the add-on of AI you're going to live forever compared to guys like Larry and me. I mean, we're sort of like more sunset people, but you're, you're, gonna, you're, you're gonna live. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're gonna live till like 100, uh, you know, because you know, you'll probably be higher income people than the average. You live actually four years longer, according to actual, actuarial tables, by just you know, sort of being smarter and more prosperous. And with modern uh, advances in medicine, you're gonna have amazing lives. Amazing lives. So th th Larry just started me off with one question, so it's, it's time for me to shut down and let him ask another one. So I'll ask something. I, I noticed there was a particular moment when people were, people were paying very close attention throughout, but there was one particular moment as you were answering when I noticed people were especially focused. Um, you remarked on how you had a much greater ability today than you would have had 25 years ago to pick winners and to pick people who were really remarkable. So among two people who come and meet you, both of whom have some good kind of Latin honors from some kind of top school, have had really good jo summer jobs at some kind of groovy financial institution, were the leader in some important extracurricular activity, and so they've got really great resumes. You somehow look at some of them, some people who are like that and say this person's really a, a winner who's got a chance to be an important part of the future of my institution, and someone else probably gonna have a great life, but you're not gonna bet on to be the future of your institution. What are you looking at that helps you tell the difference between the one you think is going to be a winner and 
the one where you've got less of that sense? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, and, um, you know, it starts out, this is like a primer for you, right? So everybody's got a, re a resume, a CV or something. And, you know, by the time somebody gets to me, they've been through the rest of the firm. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm like the last chance saloon. Uh, and, you know, so it's, it, you know, these are going to be good people. Uh, and, and usually each of you buries in a resume something, you know, like you were the, the intergalactic chess champion of the world at, <laughs> at you know, sort of like six. Uh, and the only reason you put that in is so somebody like me will read it and ask you about it, right? That, that's why you put it in. It's not because you won the intergalactic chess champion. So, so I, I, I always like to fall for that and let people believe that they're manipulating me. Uh, and, and so uh, I'll, I'll ask about it, you know, like, tell me about your chess. And how did you, how'd you start with that? I, I don't really care. But, you know, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't say that. Uh, you know, I, I just want to see how somebody's mind's working. Since they set up a manipulative interview, uh, I, I should participate in it, and, 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 right? And, and see where it goes. Uh, and, and then uh, when I burn out of that, uh, you know, I'll look at something else or I'll start talking about something that's happened in my day, uh, which is pretty interesting. I think that's the only reason why I'm sharing it. Uh, and, and see whether the person I'm talking to is, is, it completely freezes. Like, why is this guy talking about something other than a pattern that uh, you know, I'm expecting? And the only reason I'm doing it is I'm excited about something. And if you sit there you know, like a stool uh, and you know, um, like, what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is I'm inviting you to a conversation. I'm inviting you to be my equal, which I assume you are. You're just younger, right? So you don't have as many experiences, but you're just as good. I assume you're just as good, or I want you actually to be just as good. So if you sit there and freeze, that's a bad thing. If you join the conversation and, and join the party, then I try and figure out how your mind works. Like, how flexible are you? If we're talking about something, how perceptive are you? Uh, how spontaneous are you? Um, does your mind work uh, apart from a conversation where you're busy calculating something, or are you engaged? Uh, I, I always look at somebody's eyes because I found that uh, the, the eyes really are the window to the soul. Uh, you, you can't hide if you're looking somebody in the eye. And, and what I try and do, I know this sounds weird, I was thinking about not saying this because you have some camera, uh, is, 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 is I try and just like take myself and, and sort of enter your mind. Uh, and because I want to experience you and, and see what you're like. And, um, and, and how are you going to do under stress? How, how are you going to do with changes in things. Uh, and, you know, um, I'm, I'm looking for you uh, to what we call in the trade, uh, hold the table. I, I don't need you to take over the table, but I want you to, to be an equal. Uh, and if you keep falling back and don't want to do that and are passive, that, that's like not a winning hand. Uh, you know, to over talk me, that's usually like a bad thing because then you're not polite, uh, you know, and all I want is a remarkable person who could like follow wherever we're going. And it's a little like, um, I'm not even sure if I can say this in a Me Too world, uh, it's like speed dating. Is there some kind of something that happens when you're talking to somebody or, or are they just like remote? They, they can't connect. Uh, I like people who can connect, who, who have really powerful minds, but are flexible and easy, comfortable with, with who they are. Uh, and, and so if somebody can pass that test and, and has really spectacular resume, you'll be amazed. Some people are jerks. They're really unattractive humans. And I don't go for it. I won't go for it. I don't want to spend time with brilliant weirdos. 
And, and the reason is, one, I don't like it. But secondly, in, a, in an organization, uh, that's a bad thing Be because everybody needs to cooperate on certain things. Knowledge isn't an isolated phenomenon. No knowledge is created, you know, sort of in, 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 by different parts of an organization. And if, if people aren't open and transparent, uh, then they're, they're inhibiting something. And if they're truly weird, then everybody spends their time going around them. Uh, and, and that is a very bad thing. Uh, even, you know, if you're truly bright like that, those people basically go off and they start their own businesses or their own organizations because they, they, they can't be contained with the rest of us normal humans, right? They're just too much of a pain in the tail. Uh, so that, that's sort of how I do it. And, and you know, it's easy to pass that test. All you have to do is be easy and extraordinary. Um, you know, why, why, would, why would that be a problem? Uh, and, um, you know, there's also a, a sort of a BS test. Nobody can pass that. If you don't know something, don't make it up. It's easy to say, you know, I really haven't thought about that or I'm not familiar with that. Uh, and then you can ask me because uh, ostensibly I know something. Maybe I don't know enough. That's why I'm asking. So, so you know, you have to be totally centered and true to yourself. And, and that's how you display yourself. And I'm a willing buyer. I'm easily amazed. You know, you don't have to try hard. It's just who you are. I'm going to take this to a very different place. We'll come back to uh, management and interacting with people and stuff uh, in a few moments. But carried interest taxation. If you... <laughs> yeah, the idea I came up for this, you can if imagine. You, if, you, <laughs> if you study, if you take our economics classes here in our economics department, and let me stipulate at the beginning that nobody in our economics department uh, has a net worth that's 1% of yours. But if you take our economics, uh, if you take classes in our economics department, you sort of learn that as a principle of having a kind of efficient tax system and having a kind of fair tax system, income should presumptively get taxed at the same rate, regardless of precisely how it's made. And that way, there'll be a level playing field, and resources will be balanced, and be fair, and all that kind of stuff. As, as you know, and probably most of the people in the room know, we don't have a tax code that's entirely like that in the United States. And one important respect in which we have it is that if you earn money by getting a salary, you pay a full tax rate on that. If you earn money by making investments on behalf of other people and taking a share of the profits that, that you make on those investments, then you basically get taxed on that income as uh, capital gains, and your tax rate's about half as high. The consequence of that is that mostly for people who work in private equity, the people who are most senior have about half as high a tax rate as their personal assistants do. And that seems a little unreasonable to a lot of people. And you have spoken out passionately and very strongly um, in favor of those breaks for carried interest. Why do you do that? Well, let, let me. <laughs> It's good I'm in a friendly setting. <laughs> but let me ask you one question before I answer that. What, what, what is the uh, tax rate uh, of my secretary? Since it's half of mine, what, or mine is half of theirs, what, what, what is my secretary's tax rate? Um, I'm guessing that your assistance, you may be in a position to have a quite remarkably highly paid assistant in Ferris. <laughs> um, but um, 
I'm guessing that if you exclude uh, the payroll tax, um, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that if you, I'm guessing if you add in the various taxes, it's probably 35 or 40 percent. Yeah, my, my, mine is 48. So I don't think I need to answer the rest of your question. <laughs> well, wait, well, wait. If, if yours is 48, it's not because you're paying 48 on your carried interest. So you may somehow be generous enough to the rest of us to not be taking your income in the form of carried interest. So that's great. But I wasn't asking about your taxes. I was asking about the taxes Ooh. of people who benefit Ooh. from the carried interest tax break, which is at the capital gains rate, which is at the federal level in the range of below 25. I, I have a lot of uh, current income. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm, carry, I'm just asking carry, about carried carry, interest. I'm not going to, I'm asking yeah, about well, your I mean, tax rate. I'm asking the, about, this sounds I'm very, asking about carried interest. This sounds very much which like is a feature a, of your industry. It, it, it sounds Thanks. very much like a democratic question. Um, <laughs> that, 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 that um, you know, I, I'm paying 48 all in. Uh, and I have uh, very large amounts of current income, uh, less proportionately uh, in uh, uh, carried interest. Uh, and uh, and I, I live, uh, uh, for, for my sins, in a place called New York City and New York State. So, so when uh, there was a supposed tax reform uh, by the current government, uh, my taxes went up. Uh, you, you know, the, the current thing, if, if Larry was doing the full interview, he said, he'd say, and you got a tax break, you know? And my tax break is that it went up. I uh, feel your it, pain. Uh, and, uh, well, it's not that much fun. Uh, you know, we, we have about the most progressive tax structure uh, in the world in the United States. Uh, you know, you've got 1%, uh, uh, you know, a top 1%. Uh, pays somewhere between 38 and 40 percent of federal income tax, and in New York City, New York State, it's close to the mid 40s. So, so we really have like a oddball inverted uh, pyramid. So the rhetoric. Uh, you know, I'm not doing rhetoric. I'm just asking about. I'm just asking you about. I'm not asking you about your taxes. I'm not asking about progressivity. I'm just asking you about carried interest. Well. Just that, carried interest. Maybe it doesn't apply to you at all, for all I know. I'm yeah, just asking you about carried interest. Well, Is there a defense for carried I, interest? Look, what, what, you're, you're a hey, pillar of the private equity industry. Hey, hey, carried interest is a major feature of the private equity industry. This, I'm just asking you about carried interest. Not about, I, wouldn't, this, I wouldn't dream of doing an ad hominem thing addressing your, uh, your taxes or your situation. I'm just asking about carried interest. It's like a dog with a bone. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, uh, that, that, what, what, I, what I say, just, you know, um, uh, carried interest has been around since, I think, 1937. Uh, that was before I was born. That was before your parents were born. Uh, it's probably before... Racism's your... been around for 300 years. I mean, that doesn't constitute... <laughs> the fact that it's been around since 1937 surely can't be the basis Sorry. of the defense. Well, the, the basic of the surely defense... Surely you can do better than that. The, well, not really. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, the basis of the expense of, 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 of the argument is that it's always been like this. Uh, and, and so what do I know? Uh, you know, you're the person who wants to change it. Not, not me. So, so it was good enough uh, for generations uh, of. So of, slavery. I mean, I mean, lots of things have been around for a long time. We're, we're not going to that. Uh, you know. So, so I, I uh, you know, I, I just look at the world the way it is. Uh, it's, it's a, frankly, it's a pretty small number uh, in the context of the federal budget. Uh, it, it seems to attract capital, uh, and. Um, you know, it's been changed. There's now um, sort of a three-year window uh, that, uh, um, you know, used to be you could sell something and just get normal capital gains. Now there's a specially designed provision so, so, so that you have to be a longer-term uh, investor. Uh, and, you know, I, I never took an economics course. Uh, I've somehow managed to sort of make my way. Uh, and so I, I leave this one to you uh, to resolve. Okay, um, let's, um, what's your sense? I mean, you've probably made the most, I think, I think you can make uh, a case 
that in terms of private philanthropic uh, initiatives that promote understanding and connection between the United States and China at uh, a, what surely a very, very difficult moment. I think you can make a case that uh, the Schwartzman Scholars uh, Program is the most important initiative that's been undertaken since China became of scale. I think that you'll have a legacy from that, like Cecil Rhodes um, had uh, from starting the Rhodes Scholars uh, Program a little more uh, than, uh, than, than a century ago. In the process of doing that, you must have gotten tremendous insight into how the Chinese think and how the Chinese uh, think about uh, connection with us. Um, and so I, I'd just be interested in your thoughts. I'm not sure there are many Americans or any Americans who'd be better qualified to kind of provide a perspective on this than you. Um, how China sees the United States uh, right now and how the world looks from the perspective of China and how that ought to inform the approach that we take. Yeah, well, this is another one where Larry knows all the answers also. Uh, and um, because he goes there an enormous amount and has a lot of knowledge. Um, you know, just, just for uh, a second to start out, you know, the Schwarzman Scholar Program is, uh, you'll find as you get older, you get involved with things that you never thought you would just by the circumstances of your life and the Chinese government uh, without being solicited uh, when we went public in 2007. Uh, bought 9.9% .9 of, uh, of our uh, company with non-voting stock, uh, thank you, uh, and no seat on the board, because I didn't even know who these people were. Uh, and, and so I, I, di I didn't want to create complexity uh, for us. And, and we, you know, so, so a after a few years, uh, like, like all university presidents do, uh, they came to see me and said, give me money. It's, it's, it's a very familiar refrain. You could do it in Chinese, you do it in Mandarin, you can do it in English. Uh, they had the bad luck of trying to do it right in the teeth of the financial crisis. Uh, and, and so the answer was go away. Uh, and then they waited for a while and then they came back just like Larry just did. Uh, and and uh, you know, so I realized I probably had to do something and they didn't much care what I did as long as I did something that was significant. Uh, and so I, I looked at what, what's, the, what's the issue that's going to be affecting China uh, over the foreseeable future, and how do I get involved with it um, and, and make a difference? Uh, and what I saw was U.S. populism starting in 2007. Populism always grows. First, they look for domestic devils, financial people, <laughs> business people, they attack them, but nothing changes for the people who are disadvantaged. So, so then they run out of domestic candidates and they look for a foreign devil. So it's pretty clear to me it was going to be China. And the reason it would be China is they were growing faster than everybody else. They were putting on, at that time, 10 million jobs a year. We were losing jobs. Wealth was being transferred. So it was an easy identification. And, and so I thought something bad was going to happen between the US and China. And, and China potentially with the rest of the world. And, and so I, I looked at you know, starting something that you know, became the Schwarzman Scholars. I used the Rhodes Scholar model to attract like amazing people and take them to China, but it's different going to China than it is to Oxford. So in, in China, you don't know the language. Uh, you don't know how the government structure uh, works. It, it's all far. Uh, it's really alien. And, and so we tried to set up something really special you know, so you'd have a mentor who can, you know, sort of show you around how the country works, trips, uh, you know, in the countryside as well as to the big cities, uh, you know, working at a ministry or, or a company or something, and, you know, do, do, besides your academic work. Uh, and we just had every conceivable way to introduce people 
uh, to what China felt like, so you weren't just a student uh, doing academic work. The thing's been an amazing success. You know, I think we, we take one, I think we're like 4%. Harvard's like, get into Harvard is five, get into you know, Schwarzman Scholars is like four, except we were doing it from the 5% of the Harvard people. So, I mean, this is like, you know, one thing for sure, I could never be accepted. I, I keep doing all these things in my life where I could never be accepted uh, that I'd create. So, so we have a bunch of uh, Schwarzman Scholars here. Why don't you just stand up and be recognized? Because, you know, <laughs> And, and, and you should know uh, that Harvard is the number one uh, participant uh, in the program. We had 140 uh, students last year. Harvard has 10. Uh, the next is eight, and then it drops to four. Uh, so you rule. Uh, now, in answer to Larry's question, how does China look at the US? Well, it's rapidly changing. Um, you know. Uh, China, if you haven't studied it, basically made a decision around 1979, 1980, when they had a new uh, uh, head of their country, uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping, where, where they basically decided to graft on to, to a central planning model uh, with government companies, uh, the private sector. And they basically let it say, go, go out and make money and prosper. And they kept a, a planning model, a central planning model on top of it particularly for infrastructure. They still kept their uh, government, state-owned enterprises uh, going, but the private sector has just exploded. Uh, the Chinese are, uh, as a culture, uh, in incredibly energetic. Um, uh, they, you know, talk about a tough deal. Uh, if you had to make your way in a country with 1.3 billion people, all of whom are trying to make it, this is pretty competitive. And so the people in China uh, are, are flexible, uh, and, that, and they, they're always looking for an opening, uh, some way to make their life uh, better. They don't have laws, uh, particularly. They have laws, but they're funny. No one is meant to obey them. Uh, and, and so uh, they're sort of guideposts, but they basically use them if they want to put somebody in jail. And since nobody obeys the law, everybody's guilty. Uh, and if they want you to be. Uh, so there's a sense of insecurity uh, that people have in the country as well as that. And so it's basically a, a series, a web of interpersonal relationships that controls what you do and how secure uh, you feel, which makes them difficult to change on certain things because if you change, you know, those networks could, could be... Uh, uh, strained and you won't be protected as much. So getting change actually made in China is much more difficult uh, than you think for, for you know, an economy that grew at three times the rate uh, uh, of the United States. So, so what's happened, and I think this is what Larry was asking me to, to answer, is, is you know, they, they had this whole set of uh, policies uh, starting uh, around 17, 1979 which were appropriate for a developing country, uh, much like the United States had in the 19th century. Very high tariff walls, limited market opening. Uh, you know, it was added with some other types of practices we, we wouldn't normally do on intellectual property and all kinds of um, sort of policies that were alien uh, to developed countries in the United States, but also uh, to the West. And, and, and so they've now reached the stage, and we had different governments in the United States sort of, you know, sort of begging them to change and, quote, be more like us. That doesn't mean us as people. It, it means more incongruence uh, with, uh, you know, sort of the developed country uh, standards. And um, so, so, you know, we, we failed uh, with, uh, I'd, I'd say, Larry, I think this is fair. Every president failed failed for 70 years to, to get real change. There was a little bit of a change during the WTO uh, uh, admission thing, but fundamentally, China made its own way. And there was an underlying assumption uh, that when they became prosperous, they would, quote, become more like us. That was a huge bet, uh, and the jury is out 
uh, as to whether that was a bet that's going to come home. So, so the current government, uh, you know, uh, leaving aside that, that they're not particularly articulate about their objectives, basically is just trying to level the playing field between China and rest of the world. Uh, so, so one simple way of thinking about it uh, is that um, if you take uh, uh, tariffs plus taxes before we increase tariffs, it, it, it's about three times more expensive for the U.S. to export on average to China as it is for them to bring product in. Uh, our markets are, for most things, really completely open. Uh, theirs uh, are not. And, and so what the current government is trying to do is basically just say, hey, how about it? You've, you've won the game. E even though your GDP per capita is only $10,000, it's up from whatever it was when they started this adventure at $300 or $400. It's, it's the biggest economic miracle probably in world history in a 40-year <laughs> period. Uh, and come on, like join the party of like grown-ups. And uh, so... If, if you were winning at that rate, how anxious would you be to change? Not too anxious, right? I mean, they have a great deal. And, and, you know, but the problem is they're getting so big now, it's hard to keep that deal going. And, and so you know, the current government in the United States you know, is asking them to change. I, I've had direct conversations uh, about this with really all their uh, top people. And you know, in the government, they're, they're pretty open because they realize that these imbalances are just going to get people outside of China more and more frustrated and angry. Uh, and that'll be uh, that acting out on the part of the developed countries has the potential to uh, really damage um, China. So, so for whatever the reasons, which some of which I know but can't share, um, th these two sides uh, ha haven't been able to get together uh, in part uh, because the reformers, if you will, it's a simple way of explaining it, in, in China who were willing to, to really enter into uh, arrangements with the U.S. and the rest of the world uh, to, to, to become much more um, transparent and open, uh, have their own internal politics. Of the, you, you call these, I guess, uh, in the trade, hardliners. Uh, and they say, we're doing fine. Why do we have to um, um, make any arrangements? And the history of China with the West intervening and, and basically seizing Hong Kong, if you will, uh, and, and the Chinese had, like, as they say it, we had a really bad 150 to 200 years being pushed around by the West. So whenever you push them, it, it sort of hits a you know, sort of a psychological button of I'm being pushed, I don't want to be pushed ever again. Uh, and, and so we have this um, difficulty uh, in getting together. Uh, and and um, they, they, at the highest levels uh, in their country, they, they understand the frustration on the U.S. side, uh, but they've got their internal politics. And, and you know, our government whacking them uh, with tariffs is sort of what's happening here. Uh, I think there's a stunned amazement. And, and also, when they get sort of ready to do something, they, they get hit by some communication uh, from, from our country uh, where it's like, why did they say that nasty thing about me? I was, I was about to do something. And then that sort of creates uh, more hubbub. So, so um, they, 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 the way they're thinking uh, about us now, because we're, we're also um, using uh, technology as, as an issue, uh, in large part because they're pretty much shut technologically, and we've been supplying them, and they're doing great. Uh, but but um, you know, we can't take advantage uh, of their doing great because they don't let us. That you know, our government's basically said, look, this is sort of crazy. We, we ought to have reciprocal type of stuff with technology. I mean, you know, like, we're helping you. You're not helping us at all. Well, why don't we like have some kind of level playing field? And the Chinese can't really do that because they use technology to protect uh, the, um, uh, you know, their stability, uh, if you will. So technology is on some bad track. Uh, trade could get straightened out. Uh, but now they look at us. I think 
uh, because we're becoming very aggressive in their point of view and we're making life inconvenient. We're forcing them to take on debt. They wanted to pay down debt. Uh, we're uh, denying them supply uh, of certain critical uh, you know, sort of electronics, uh, semiconductors and things. So it's forcing them to divert or slow down or, or, or really what it's going to do. It's going to force them to accelerate their own development and not be dependent on us. And they will figure that out in some not so long time frame whether that's five years, seven years, 10 years, I don't know. So, so it's, it's become a, um, a not good situation. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of respect, leave aside tariffs and this stuff uh, for the states. Uh, you, you know, they're smartest people, uh, you know, go to Harvard, some even under assumed names. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and they love coming here, and they love, love uh, aspects uh, of our culture. Um, and, you know, the, the absent manipulation by the central government with uh, propaganda, I would say that, you know, the average person in China really, um, you know, sort of has a lot of respect for the United States and what we can do, and, and, and they, they, they feel that they're coming of age but aren't there yet. That was a very long answer to actually a purposely complicated question. But. We're, we don't have that much longer, so I'm going to open this up and let me take two or three. Take, I'll take several questions and then perhaps ask you to answer them as a group. Uh, Steve, questions? Yes. Got it. Okay, got it. Yes. Um, hey, Mr. Carlson. Um, my name is Diana. I'm one of the graduate school students at the Kennedy School. Um, one of my questions are, is um, there's a recent rise um, about impact investing, and I know Blackstone. Um, there's a recent rise of, for impact investing, and I know Blackstone had a um, rise in the or yeah. not. So I'm just wondering what's your stance on it, and what right. are the difficulties got it. involved? Got it. One more. Yes. I'm Yvonne. I'm a junior at college. And I'm just curious, was there any moment when you felt like you made it? Or what do you see as like the greatest success? OK. <laughs> uh, knock them off fast. We work. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not a we work expert. Um, you know, uh, we, we own a company that was sort of their uh, evidently principal competitor, um, and, and ours actually makes a bunch of money. Uh, and, 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 and it's valued somewhere around $3 uh, billion. So the idea that somebody can show up with no money uh, and be worth 47 uh, is an absurdity. Uh, and things like this happen in finance at certain stages of the economic cycle. And uh, I was educated when I started uh, in finance in the early 70s that there are two kinds of sardines. Well, one are trading sardines, and the other are eating sardines. So, so you, when you, you have people in a very isolated, narrow vertical uh, called tech, privately uh, owned uh, tech, where the people who make the investments Every time it goes up, they make more money. Uh, they can put in a little in the next round, but what they put in the, at the bottom in the early round, that's worth more. So they have an incentive uh, to, to uh, always mark up their own positions. Uh, those are trading sardines. Nobody eats them, right? You just like keep trading up valuations. The eating moment is when you actually serve this this stuff, you open the can, and you take it out to regular people who eat sardines, don't trade them. 
Uh, that's called the public market. And basically, they barfed all over it. These were, these were, these were, these were rotted uh, sardines. And, and there's no reason you would ever do 10-year leases and think you can lease them for a year or two or three. And what happens in, in the real world um, is, is that when you have a recession, all of a sudden, you know, people withdraw space from the market. They typically cancel leases. Even though this is short-term space, everybody gets really hurt. And if, you're, if your clients are only there for short periods of time, uh, you, will, you will be severely damaged. So the whole thing was like a, a mystery uh, to me. How could we own a, co a company that makes hundreds of millions of dollars worth three billion, and these clucks uh, are out there, you know, losing a fortune? They, they, they had an overhead structure of a billion three. That's outside of running the business. These are just people hanging around, basically. I mean, <laughs> what is this? So I don't know much, but I know enough. OK, so that was that one. Impact investing, a good thing. Uh, the institutional uh, community is, is, is uh, changing the way it looks at all kinds of things, uh, ESG and, and, and uh, you know, sort of um, how do you generate energy. And, and there's a huge emphasis on this. And, and, and so we've recently started uh, an impact business. Uh, and it's just going to be part uh, of the normal um, investment uh, structure uh, for uh, uh, institutional uh, investors. Uh, now, the third one is, you know, what, what is my greatest hits or something? Wait, wait, wait. I'm, I'm going to ask a follow-up on impact yeah, investing. Yeah. Would you, there are a lot of claims that if you do impact investing, it's kind of win-win. You know, you serve your purpose of helping the environment or helping workers or promoting diversity or whatever it is you're trying to do. And the companies that are really good at that are more profitable too. If you were managing a portfolio and the only objective were to make money, so you weren't, you didn't value the impact values, you just valued making money, would you put any emphasis on the impact factors? I, th I think it's a little- Based on your knowledge of the market. I, I think certain things are fine. In other words, uh, we uh, have all kinds of initiatives as a result of this uh, to um, uh, save energy. Uh, and, you know, we started out saving energy to be good guys. Now we realize this is terrific. Uh, so, so we save 15% of our energy bill at all of our companies as a result of things that we've learned uh, as part of, uh, you know, uh, ESG. So, so there are elements of this that are, that are really good to incorporate. There, there are other elements that, that don't fit uh, in, in the same way that you wouldn't normally uh, do. So I, I think it's a mix, I would say, Larry. Um, and, and then uh, on this other question of, uh, you know, what, what are my greatest hits or something? Um, you know. so when did you feel like you really came into your own? I don't know. Um, I don't think like that. Uh, I do discrete things. Um, it, it was easy to come into my own when we raised uh, our first uh, fund where I, I thought we were going to completely fail. Um, that's frightening. Uh, and, you know, when the, the chief investment officer of Prudential decided to give us $100 million, and this was the number one investor in the world in 1986, $100 million from the good housekeeping seal of approval. I knew we went from a bunch of overconfident, then completely desperate people that we were going to make it. That was a moment where, you know, it was really near the start of Blackstone, where I knew we, we weren't going to auger in uh, and fail. And we raised the biggest first time fund in history, and, you know, it sort of started this out. But before that, I was pitching, and no one was catching. That's, that's very disturbing when you're absolutely desperate for someone to say yes. And it's, it's like Gladiator. And you're Russell Crowe. And the emperor's up there. And he looks at you. And he goes, right? <laughs> and that happens all the time. And it happened to us almost with everyone. And this was the first big breakthrough. So I, I think, you know, for 
you know, our professional, we've had tons and tons of wonderful things, but that that was like, it wasn't coming of age. It was like not failing. So it depends how elegant you, you want to look at these things. We all have. Larry has, I have, you know, you have many different uh, points in your life where there are really good things happen. But it's interesting, you, you don't think about them. You, you think about your failures. Your successes, it's, I mean, how excited can you get, you know, if, 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 if you score 30 points a game and then there's another game the next day, right? I mean, you, that, that's your job. Uh, and, you know, so doing well and doing things successfully, you know, it's, it, I don't know how to explain this, but it's, it's the feeling. It's not the achievement. It's playing well. Uh, and it's moving to the open spot in the court and, and doing that successfully and taking an easy shot. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's just the feeling of doing things. That's why you do things. You don't do things just for the objective of it because you can always out-trade yourself, right? Yeah. Well, that was, I, I achieved that, let's do double. That, that never stops. It's, it's achieving that sense of rhythm in your life where no matter what somebody's throwing at you, and Larry's had a lot of this, as we all have, that, that you can handle it. Um, you don't handle everything equally well, and it's not always easy, but that sense when you finally say, throw me the ball. Okay, let, let me handle this. When you're at that stage in your life, no matter what you do with that ball or you know, whether you win that game or lose that game, that's the period when you, in effect, are, are self-actualized. And, and that's an amazing feeling. And, and you can get that almost any day, you know, once you're like that. So anyhow, we've sort of used our time up. I wanna just thank you for coming. Uh, Bill Ackman, uh, who's uh, you know uh, a guy we know, donated all the you know sort of what it takes books, um, and so Bill deserves credit for that. Uh, the book is terrific, and, <laughs> and and I say that only because people tell me, not, not because I think it's terrific. For me, it's like a pain in the ass. I mean, it's, it takes so long to 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 write, so so you should read it because it's funny. Uh, and it's also instructive. And if you like it, buy it for somebody in your family. Uh, and, and, you know, if you, if you want to buy more, buy it on Amazon and write a review, uh, you know? <laughs> and I'm, I'm giving away all the money uh, to uh, a, a charity called the New Teacher Project, uh, which is a group that um, basically recruits, identifies, and trains teachers uh, to teach in public schools. Uh, and they also help uh, public school districts uh, with curriculum. So I think that's an important thing. Uh, and, and so I couldn't be happier, frankly, that Larry was nice enough to come and get soaked on the way over, uh, and, and that all of you uh, are here. Harvard is an amazing place. You're lucky to be here, but you also are the university, and they're lucky to have you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve Schwartzman. Thank you. 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 Thank you.